Trump's never dreamed of becoming mayor of Atlanta or being considered as a possible running mate for a presidential candidate. But that is exactly what happened over the past four years, with Baum's political career shooting from a relatively unknown city council member to winning the mayor's office by a few hundred votes, to being considered as a potential running mate for President Joe Biden, to turning down a job offer in Biden's administration. Then the roller coaster ride careened downhill six months ago when Bombs became the first modern era Atlanta mayor to decide against seeking a second term in office. Along that wild four year ride, Bombs dealt with one of the most uproarious terms of any first year mayor in recent history from a crippling ransomware attack on City Hall to a global pandemic Black to an entire summer of street protest over police brutality. In an exclusive interview with the Atlanta Journal Constitution, Bombs answered questions from topics ranging from government, leadership, and their family life. I was recently reading a book and I saw uh, um, this quote from David Axelrod in the book. And he said, all you can do is everything you can do. And that really s summarizes what our administration has faced. So the cyber attack is an example of that. You just feel completely helpless, but you realize in that moment, there's not a whole lot that, that you can do other than what you can do. And for me personally, I made the decision that the city would not pay the ransom. Um, I couldn't get any reassurances that we would be able to build the system or, or that we wouldn't be taken down again. And, and I believe that we needed to build a system that we should have had in place to begin with to hopefully withstand another um, attack like that. So I, I made the very, very tough decision for us to stay offline so that we could literally build back better. Um, and, and just, I just had some fundamental issues with us paying criminals who had taken our stuff <laughs> to pay them to get our stuff back. So I remember Richard Cox, who was in our COO, three days in on the job when it happened. And I've known, I've known Richard since eighth grade. Richard said there were times he felt like he was looking at me across the table in the cafeteria at Douglas High School. Um, I'm like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> like, you know, so um, that was really tough. But as we have faced so many other challenges as a city. We, we were able to get through it, and our systems are tested every day. People are constantly uh, trying to take us offline and wreak havoc in the system. And thankfully, um, you know, we, we've been able to withstand it. But we, when we talk about infrastructure, we often think of sidewalks and streets. There aren't a lot of conversations about the infrastructure you don't see, uh, like your uh, computer network infrastructure, or even with the recent, recent challenges we had with our 911 center. That's, those are infrastructure issues that cause those challenges. So you have, as a city, we have to be very thoughtful about these things that don't always get attention or, or even a public outcry for fixing because they are just as, if not more, important. Just a month later, while the city was still reeling from the cyber attack and under pressure from the federal corruption investigation, Bottom suddenly asked for the resignations of all of her cabinet members, a group that includes about 35 of the top managers in city government, many of whom served in Mayor Kasim Reed's administration. Um, you know, I think, um, or early on, it obviously was a challenge because we had the federal investigation and uh, many of our policies and, and my thoughts on things didn't always align with the previous administration. Um, but, you know, I don't think that you can, can, can run your best race looking over your shoulder. So my commitment, just in terms of not looking back and, and having a hand or trying to have a hand in his administration is, is as much about my experience from my transition as, as wanting to have the best future ahead of me that's possible. I, I can't 
do my best work going forward if I'm constantly looking back, uh, trying to, you know, have a hand in the city. I've had four years and I'm pretty confident I could have had an another four. Uh, but I've chosen to move on, move forward, and, you know, again, I, I say it's a relay race. You pass the baton, give it to the next person, and let them lead. Bombs' popularity, both at home and on the national stage, was never higher than it was in spring 2020, when protests erupted into looting and violence downtown after Minneapolis police murdered George Floyd. She gave an impassioned speech in an effort to put out the flames of unrest. When I saw the murder of George Floyd, I hurt like a mother would hurt. And on yesterday, when I heard there were rumors about violent protests in Atlanta, I did what a mother would do. I called my son and I said, where are you? I said, I cannot protect you and black boys shouldn't be out today. So what I see happening on the streets of Atlanta is not Atlanta. When Dr. King was assassinated, we didn't do this to our city. So if you love this city, this city that has had a legacy of black mayors and black police chiefs, and people who care about this city, where more than 50% of the business owners in Metro Atlanta are minority business owners. If you care about this city, then go home. Her ascendancy to the mayor's office came amid a historic cohort of black women leading seven major US cities. Bombs went on to star in a music video by Sierra, and she ran the gamut of talk shows and appearances on magazine covers. She was even an honoree in Glamour Magazine's Women of the Year series. I've said I, I was never so much aware of being a woman in my life as I was uh, being mayor, being an elected official. Um, I've always been aware of race. I think that's by nature of growing up in Atlanta and discussions, very open discussions of civil rights movement. But I've always thought the, the whole feminist, womanist, sexist thing was a conversation for another group of people, quite honestly. Um, but when I was elected in 2010, I, I very, very quickly became aware of what it means to be a woman and the challenges that we face and the biases that we face as women. And um, even, you know, how people deal with you, their expectations, their uh, sometimes dismissal of you. And, um, you know, I very quickly came to realize, probably in 2010, um, that this whole women, womanist, feminist, sexist thing applied to me too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, unfortunately, with each year I've served in public office, there's not been a lot of times that a lot of moments that have helped to um, erase that. Put your hands on your back for me. But bombs hit a wall in her popularity in like June 2020, following the fatal police shooting of Rayshard Brooks in her native city, bringing renewed national attention to her approach to public safety amid two weeks of lethal gun violence, police misconduct, and low cop morale at home. A little Sequoia died from a bullet wound after a group of armed men shot into the car she was riding in with her mother and friend. The shooting happened in the area of University Avenue uh, on July 4th after days of peaceful, peaceful protests following the shooting death of Rayshard Brooks. We've talked a lot about what we are demanding from our officers and our communities. We've protested, we've demonstrated. We've been angry, we've cried, we've demanded action. Well, now we're demanding action for Sequoia Turner and for all of the other people who were shot in Atlanta last night and over the past few weeks, because the reality is this, these aren't police officers shooting people on the streets of Atlanta. These are members of the community shooting each other. 
an armed street gang known as the Bloods barricaded access to a Southwest Atlanta neighborhood where an officer shot Brooks. According to a warrant from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, Brooks was associated with the gang. A lawyer for the Brooks family said his relatives are unaware of any ties between Brooks and street gangs. The timeline of events solidified the notion among some that crime was out of control in Atlanta. The new at noon, the family of a little girl shot and killed during protests over Rayshard Brooks is now suing the city of Atlanta. When, anytime you have a life taken, especially that of a child, you think back on, on what could have been done differently. Um, I, I think there were a lot of dynamics happening there. Um, given the information I had at the time and, um, you know, the, what was before us, I made what I thought to be the right decision at that time, but clearly at the point that a, a child's life is taken, you know, you look back and you, you have to wonder, was there something that we could have done differently that would have made a difference? We'll never know the answer to that, but it's, it's, it is, uh, you know, the death of every single child in this city is something that I, I carry. You know, um, not that you want to have anyone killed in our city, but, um, you know, I, I know the names of the children who've lost, who've lost their lives in our city. And it is, it is um, something I, I carry very deeply in my heart. In June 2020, bombs issued a mandate requiring people in the city to wear a mask in public to prevent the spread of COVID-19, a move that followed similar orders by other local governments in Georgia that were openly defying Governor Brian Kemp, who had called a statewide mask mandate a bridge too far. Bombs enacted a mask mandate just days after she, her husband Derek, and one of their children tested positive for the coronavirus. She said Derek lost 20 pounds in a week and was suffering from long-term side effects after contracting the virus. I mean, my family is representative of a lot of families. It struck me how relieved my kids are that they're fully vaccinated. Um, my daughter is very happy to announce the day that her vaccine had taken full effect. I mean, who knew she was tracking that? But that really, I think, speaks to the anxiety they've had about COVID. So. You know, at different times, different things have resonated with them. Um, for my two oldest, you know, last summer was very, very impactful for them, especially for my oldest. Um, you know, I, for my son Lennox, COVID has created a lot of anxiety in him. I struggle to make him take his mask off at home. And he says, I don't want to get you sick. So he's very, you know, had been very thoughtful that he could carry COVID and bring it home. So I see a level of anxiety with him that I've never seen before. So they're, they're just, they're, they're different things. For my 13 year old, um, he's become very aware that Southwest Atlanta looks different than a lot of the, re uh, the rest of the city. And he even said, I just wish our community looked better. So it's different things at, at different times. Um, you know, with my daughter, um, I think it is just the, I'm very aware of the pressure and influence of social media on her as a, a young African-American girl and how she's, how she views herself and how she's represented and, and the value placed on who she is and what she is. So they're, you know, they're, they're just, I, I think my family really is like this microcosm of all the things that people experience and talk about in their families. I, I just, and the public face of it. In the same way that it was very clear to me almost five years ago that I should run for mayor of Atlanta. It is abundantly clear to me today that it is time to pass the baton on 
to someone else. Bonham said that when she ended her re-election bid, she was expecting a total of 40 people to enter the race instead of the 14 candidates who qualified. Regardless, Bonham says she knew early on that she would support Andre Dickens for mayor. Andre was my early, early, <laughs> earliest pick, I think. Um, I always say the streets don't lie. Like I could, <laughs> you can read a narrative and, but then there's what you, you hear and feel on the streets. And I always thought that when people got to know Andre and, and be exposed to Andre, um, that they would like Andre and support Andre. So I will be available in whatever way he needs me to be available. Um, I will, you know, make a promise <laughs> not, to inter not to interfere with his administration um, because that creates a whole different set of dynamics and, you know, just trust that with his season as mayor, he'll, he'll do what's best for our city. And that has been my ask of him, just do right by the people of Atlanta. That's the, the ask that I've made, just do right by the people of Atlanta. And, you know, that's, he has committed to that and it wasn't a stretch for him because I know he, he loves this city. My hope is that he's able to take our crime numbers down to a record low. That, that would be my wish for him because when crime is bad, it overshadows every single thing. Um, so it's my hope that for, um, for our, our city, to, to, for our families to feel safe in our cities, that he's able to remove that peace um, and, and hopefully our crime numbers will continue to drop. We put in some good foundational work, so I think he can have some real progress on that. Um, I hope that he's able to put to bed the city of Buckhead conversation because it's a very toxic conversation, not healthy for our city, not healthy for Wall Street when they're looking at our, our bond ratings, et cetera. Um, and then I hope, you know, he's able to move forward with a proactive and not a reactive agenda. I can tell you being, um, having served as mayor under the Trump administration in a different Congress is night and day to serving as mayor under the Biden administration. So he has a level of uh, support and um, uh, infrastructure, federal infrastructure support that we did not have for three years of my administration. So it's my hope that that continues. In her last months as mayor, Bombs has continued pushing through her legislative agenda. I would say 99.9% .9 of what we sought to accomplish this first term has been accomplished. As I've been cleaning off my desk, I tend to write myself notes in their various places on my desk and I look back on, um, you know, what my goals and priorities and um, one was to um, close out the, the transformation of Fort Mac. One was integrating work source. So, you know, they range um, and, and they were all checked off. But in terms of what I saw as achievable goals, we've been able to do that with the things that we could control. Mayor Bottoms climbed a mountain of challenges filled with a valley of issues, but she says it was an unforgettable honor to lead this city. I never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be mayor of Atlanta. I didn't even know the dream to be mayor. Growing up as a child in the 70s in Atlanta, the 70s and 80s, our mayor was almost royalty in our city. So it never occurred to me that I could, I could one day be mayor or that I would even have it in me to 
think about being mayor. So it is just beyond my wildest dreams to have been elected mayor of this city and to be able to serve. And, I, you know, sometimes it, it takes leaving the city to really appreciate what, it, what Atlanta means to people across this country, um, to travel to Iowa and, and hear people talk about Atlanta and then know that they're watching our city, or to go to Los Angeles and, and you know, see Hollywood stars who are paying attention to Atlanta and, and not focus, not, not that they're a star, but for all they've achieved, Atlanta still represents something magical. Just everyday people to see that Atlanta is still this, this North Star. To be the mayor and to have the great privilege of being the voice of a city like Atlanta is, um, like it's, it's sometimes, I sometimes have to pinch myself. And the, I think the closer I get to the end of my term, the more appreciation I've had for what this moment has meant. Um, what it's meant for me personally and, and how it has projected across the country. That Atlanta is still a very magical place. And it is, is still this place that people look to for inspiration and uh, to have been able to serve as mayor during what will likely go, go down as one of our most difficult moments in history. It's just a blessing beyond anything I could have ever imagined for myself.